So I asked the, um, the book Love Poems from God for um, poem for today. And I was a little bit startled at first, but of course, it, I think it's perfect um, as we are looking at probably one of the strangest Christmases um, holy season. It's not only Christmas, of course. As Emma Prema mentioned, there's the solstice and um, many faiths have a great celebration at this time of the year. Um, yeah, so I like to call it the holy days. So sometimes we say happy holidays. So I spell that with a Y, happy holy days. Um, and it's, yeah, it's probably one of the strangest ones, certainly that I've ever had. And we don't know what's to come, of course, but so far it's an unusual time for us when we're normally coming together, um, as Emma Prema was mentioning. Mm. And uh, at this time we can come together with a few people if we're lucky. And otherwise, um, on a screen like this. And it's also a time of year when people tend to be more you know, people that we know are often poorly in the winter season this time of year. And, and people also check out around this time of year very often, you know. I, I've lost three people very dear to me in the last month. Yeah. And, um, I know many other people are, have or are facing that too. And it's a time of year when we, we stop and, and think about those who've been with us in the past uh, as well. So the poem, I think, is very apt. And it's called The Pasts lips are not deceased. So the lips of the past are not deceased. And it says, why not look at the beauty your memory holds? So nourishing that light can be. The past's lips are not deceased. Let them comfort you if they can. So sometimes maybe the tendency of the mind can be to have a happy memory and then immediately feel sad. So maybe we have a choice to treasure it and enjoy it and let it comfort us and let the light of those golden memories comfort us. And then immediately after that, in the completely other part of the book, Another poem came called, It is a Lie. Very short, it says, It is a lie, any talk of God that does not comfort you. So, talking about, it's talking about being comforted. And we might have our own ideas about 
what could comfort us. In fact, I'm certain we have our own ideas about that. And we have our own ideas about how things should be and how they could be much better than they are. All of that goes on. So a third poem came. So I hope it's okay to share these with you. I'm always quite fascinated to see how something, someone, uh, speaks to us through this, yeah. So this one's called Certainty. And perhaps your mind is saying, yeah, that's what we need, some certainty. Let's have some of that. <laughs> so here's a thought. Certainty undermines one's power and turns happiness into a long shot. I read that bit again. Certainty undermines one's power and turns happiness into a long shot. Certainty confines. <laughs> Imagine, you might think at the moment you want some certainty, but certainty, that's it. No potential, no possibility. Hmm? It goes on. Dears, there is nothing in your life that will not change. Especially all your ideas of God. <laughs> Dears, there's nothing in your life that will not change, especially all your ideas of God. Look what the insanity of righteous certainty can do. Crusade and maim thousands. Well, by today we can say millions for sure in wanting to convert that which is already gold into gold. Mm. What amazing creatures we are hmm, to do that. Certainty can become an illness that creates hate and greed. We can see that all around us today, when we see, I'm sorry, but I have to mention this, we see UNESCO is giving money to the UK to feed our hungry children. <laughs> Today that's happening. And a very senior politician in the government has said that is unnecessary and a publicity stunt from his certainty he has said that well, the hungry children and their families do not agree and UNESCO thankfully does not agree and you know I've had I've been approached by a charity in India wanting to give money for the hungry children in the UK. <laughs> so we can see that that kind of certainty, as it says here in the poem, can become an illness that creates hate and greed. So the poem continues. God once said to me, even I am ever changing. I am ever beyond myself. Isn't that wonderful? God is beyond itself. <laughs> what I may have once put my seal upon 
may no longer be the greatest truth. Uh -huh. So our ideas of truth are shifting. And my personal, I don't want to say belief, um, I, it seems to be my personal experience perhaps is that consciousness itself is ever evolving. Yeah. Some people disagree. I'm happy to disagree at a later point. <laughs> I'm not stuck to those things. So I was going to say something along these lines, probably because I did have a question asked. And it was about my personal, it was about me. It was not a question about an eternal truth. <laughs> but apparently quite a few people have been asking uh, why Padma has gone back to Portugal. Why did she go there again? So in case you didn't know, I've lived here twice before. I'm in Portugal again. Um, so I felt to say something about this because it's on the lines of what the poems have been talking about. And it's, it's what I've learned on my spiritual journey, uh, mostly from my great spiritual friend, <laughs> might say that, Sri Swami Satchidananda. So what I really learned from being with him, and many of you have heard this before, was three things. And that was faith, surrender, and learning to live as a divine instrument. So that's what I saw while I was with him. And what I came to, it's what he taught me those things. And so I came to learn how to include those in my life and how they are foundational steps that lead from one to another, stepping stones perhaps. And from that, faith, surrender, learning to live as a divine instrument. I stepped into the clouds of unknowing. And in the beginning, it was a very wobbly place, as you can perhaps imagine. <laughs> the clouds of unknowing. Here we are in the winter time. I even have clouds around my house here. And for a while it could be uncomfortable, but I kept on with my, through faith and through having seen this spiritual path that had unfolded through my teacher and was walking on the earth in those days. So I stayed in the clouds of unknowing. Uh, as they say, some people say, walking the razor's edge. <laughs> they say, so now it's sounding really scary, walking the razor's edge in the clouds of unknowing. <laughs> so this is really, faith is coming here. And you find, as you do this, you find the firmest ground beneath your feet. Firmer than the ground that is actually beneath your actual feet. 
you find the firm foundation that is beyond words. Exceptional uh, surprise, probably. Yeah, a delight. And then the clouds of unknowing became like warm friends that embraced me. And it became became like that, became beautiful. And the place, I came to understand it as the place of potential. So the opposite of what we were saying about certainty or what the poem was saying, which the mind thinks it wants that, that kind of certainty. And then we'll know where we stand and everything will be done and that. So quite different. The Clouds of Unknowing. There's even a book um, called The Clouds of Unknowing. It was said to be by a medieval monk. <laughs> Turned out it wasn't. It was by somebody in the 1800s. I can't remember who it was, but a very uh, beautiful soul who wrote it. You can still get the book. It's very nice. Very, I've it's very helpful, very lovely to read that. Um, so through the clouds of unknowing uh, and learning to live as a divine instrument, I was moved around from place to place. That was all fine. I have <laughs> lived in a lot of different places, a lot of different countries. I never made one single decision to do any of them. Mm -hmm. And I never made the decision to leave. So I watched what was happening. And I would go somewhere, I would arrive somewhere. And uh, in those days, begin, not even begin to offer yoga classes. Somehow I would be asked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just remembering when I was in Spain and they'd heard that uh, I did yoga, I taught yoga, and they even, they kind of kidnapped me. Two ladies organized a place and um, they, I was working in my husband's business then and they captured him <laughs> with big eyes and soft touches and said, please, you have to let her go and do this. <laughs> So um, not, not making those decisions, you see, but when they come, accepting. And then a Sangha would form, a group of heart friends like us would form, would become very strong. And as soon as it was very strong and beautiful, the universe would take me out <laughs> and put me somewhere else. So I was in England for 10 years before I came here and I actually thought that's where I <laughs> actually had that thought pass through. Probably it's the end of moving countries huh? and God smiled up her sleeve <laughs> and brought me here. Um, I, I knew I was moving, I had what I was going to do for and spent a year looking for a house in Devon. Nothing came to anything. And the Portugal side, it all happened in a week. So, and even with a pandemic and all those things, here I am. And um, I'm always very happy wherever I am. And I've lived in many, in places that look very different. In the desert, ah, oh, the beauty of the desert. The, you must miss England and all its greenery. What? No, the desert makes my heart sing. And then going to England, what about the desert? No, the green <laughs> makes my heart sing. So God even, it seems God even changes our mind. Isn't that such a beautiful grace? In this form of surrender, 
this way of living, not even that is needed, is taken care of. So what has this got to do with Christmas? You might be wondering. And so what I, what I know from reading and study um, is that the path that Jesus took in Christianity is called kenosis. <laughs> kenosis. See some people writing stuff down, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. Yeah. If you're interested in this, there's a wonderful book called Wisdom Jesus about Jesus as um, a teacher of non-duality. Yeah, so beautiful. So the path of kenosis is one of surrender. Neem Karoli Baba, a great yoga teacher, uh, he was asked, he told his Western disciples to meditate like Christ. They said, whoa, um, how, is, how did he meditate? We don't, how did he meditate? And uh, they say apparently he suddenly went very still when they asked that question. And he was never normally still. He went very still and he closed his eyes and a tear rolled down his cheek. And he said he lost himself in love. He lost himself in love. And that's a description of kenosis of this path of surrender so that you're melting every part that is not love itself there aren't any of those parts actually but it seems to us that they are just dissolving in the sweetness in the light, in the pure love that we are. So like the poem said, what is already gold, that's us. We are already that. And if we're not seeming to know that, which most of us don't, including myself, still learning, always, every day is more, every day, not even every day, every moment, every moment is created anew, you've never been in this moment before, in the form that you're in, in this moment. A moment to go was different. Hmm? <laughs> your being, your thoughts, everything is a flow, a beautiful flow. So, when we approach this path of surrender. I think at the beginning I was pushed. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I can remember it felt like jumping off a cliff without a safety net. Yeah, jumping into the clouds of unknowing. But if you see someone standing in the clouds, apparently standing on nothing, 
that's easier, huh? <laughs> Maybe to jump. And then the process of love, loving everything into being for its own awakening as us. That process unfolds. And our desire for certainty dissolves too. How could I, the little I, possibly think I can know what is best? How could I be certain that it would be the best for all? But love itself, the beloved, the divine, or as I crazily like to call it, God. <laughs> Very unfashionable term these days, which also makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that one, the one that is greater than all of us, than any of us, the one you may perhaps consider to be greater than you, that one, that one knows. And this lavishing blessings and love and light, pouring them, they're pouring the whole time. Blessings are falling, <laughs> showering like this rain, constantly in this universe of ours. And in our wisdom, we put up an umbrella to keep them off with our clever mind. So the mind is clever, very helpful, very interesting. You'll never be bored if you have a mind. <laughs> Sometimes you might wish you didn't have one. <laughs> The mind is great, a great friend to have. And yoga is about making the mind your friend, finding ways, beautiful ways to do that. All our wonderful teachers are sharing all these different ways that might be helpful for us. And huge, deep gratitude to all of you for this, for sharing these ways. And if you say, well, I'm not doing that, Padma, you are by being you and by being heart connected with the divine. might be the only job we have, the only one we actually need to do, is to find our connection. with a divine. And that connection, that place of connection, is where God so clearly hid it, right in the center of your own heart. Where my teacher said, God thought we'd never think to look there. <laughs> we would look everywhere else, on the moon, under the ocean, but the last place we think to look is in our own heart. <laughs> right under your nose. But once it's found, it's never lost. 
So if you, I guess, if you're here, you've experienced and found the heart connection with the all that is, with love itself, with God. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> with absolute consciousness, <laughs> the universe, Mother Nature. <laughs> God. If you found that, if you tasted that, if you felt that, it's never lost. You, it's always there. It seems to be lost. Sometimes that happens. Life can make us feel very wobbled sometimes and we might be so distracted by what's happening outside that we seem to lose our sense of connection but we can find our way back because we remember that that happened and that we had that experience and if we've had this experience Nothing anyone says at any time can ever make us say it didn't happen. Am I right? Can never be denied. So that memory of that experience, that's a help. So the memories of the past slips that the poem spoke of. Reconnecting with happy times, happy memories. That helps us to let those happy memories be our mirror to the future. So whatever we're holding in our heart, in our mind, in our being right now, is always our mirror to the future. So this information is helpful if we think we might like to have a nice future. Our, the way we are, the way we be, That's important. And when we're heart connected with love itself, the way we be is beautiful. Whatever is happening around in the world. So Christmas time, it's a time for us to remember that this possibility of living this way was born on the earth as that baby that became the realized Christ light or as Neem Karoli Baba said, who lost himself in love And if your mind says that doesn't sound like a very good idea, consider the life of that holy being, that beautiful great light of love that lived on the earth and is still alive and present with us. and is present within us, within each of us. So these holidays, these holy days, oh, I wish I could go out and party, etc. We could reframe that and say, what a beautiful time to reconsider the meaning of Christmas. 
and the reminder that this potential to become that love and that light. We're given this time to go within and explore that possibility for ourselves. So I'd like to offer us that possibility now to have a little meditation together if that's okay. So I invite you to find a comfortable position. And letting the eyes gently close. Let the eyelids close over the eyes like butterflies' wings, so gentle. And take a gentle breath in through the nose and the gentlest of sighs out through the mouth. A very gentle breath that would not even disturb that butterfly's wings. Taking two more sweet breaths in through the heart and gently sighing out. Letting this gentleness flow through the whole body and feel the body like a sponge soaking it up. The body becoming gentleness itself. Allow the body to move in any way it wants to. And notice if the breath changes. When we allow the body to find its own position, the breath becomes more free and easy and full. We invite the breath to find its freedom too, in gentleness. Observe how the breath flows, changes, when it's allowed to be free. Let's offer the same freedom to the mind to become gentle. Inviting the mind to rest in its own gentleness. Resting in its own sweetness and peace. the gentle hand come to meet the heart center.
observing the response of the heart center within you. The response of the body, the breath, the mind, the heart, all as one. Feeling the mind settling into the heart center in this oneness of your being. Breathing in through the heart center and out from the heart center. Taking three more heart breaths in and out. Finding yourself in the heart beyond the heart. In your expanded consciousness. Connected with the all that is. The infinite. Connecting with love itself. That is present within you and everywhere at the same time. Staying present with this beautiful presence of the heart. the presence of love itself. Embracing the possibility, the possibility of melting. into this love. This love that you already are.
Let's take some moments for personal prayer. And perhaps consider all those on our earth who would love to know themselves as love all those who are not deeply in this experience. Let's hold them in these arms of love. That we find ourselves to be. Embracing them all. And if we wish to, taking some moments to connect with the dear ones, ones we would like to pray for, and simply embrace them within this infinite love. where all things are known and held and loved. No need to ask. Simply holding and being with in this infinite love. And we can include those who are no longer in a body on the earth. Connecting with them all. within this infinite love. Inviting all those in need to draw near. to be embraced within this love.
शांति And we can know that this is the spirit of Christmas. And that Christmas can be every day and every moment. The light of this love can shine through us to all. This love can flow through us to all. And if you'd like to join me in offering the Gayatri Mantra, the beautiful mantra and prayer of light for the enlightenment of all, the freedom from suffering, the becoming of the light of love. We'll chant it three times. Om Gur Bhuva Swaha Tat Sabituru Varanyam Bhargo Devasya Dimahi Dhiyo Yonaha Prachodayat Om Bhur Bhuva Swaha Tat Sabituru Varanyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyoyonaha Prachodayat Om Bhur Bhuva Swaha Tat Sabituru Varanyam Bhargo Devasya Dimahi Dhiyo Yonaha Prachodayat Om Shanti 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 May there be peace on the earth. May there be peace in the heavens. May there be peace upon and within all the waters. And may there be peace in every heart. Jai Shri Satguru Prem Jai.
So there doesn't have to be something next. This is enough, more than enough. And when we take this time, huge wave of gratitude seems to arise in us. So we can just welcome that and stay with that. And that keeps us connected. Oh, thank you all so much for coming together to share this joyful light and love of Christmas together. I have a little friend with me. I've been kind of hoping I might a dog might come to me when I'm here, hasn't come yet, but um, <laughs> just taking a look at all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and now saying goodbye. <laughs>